Good evening once again, church family. Welcome back to Wisdom Wednesday tonight. We're going to be in Psalm 98. So if you have your Bibles handy, which is always, I trust that you do, go ahead and make your way there. Psalm 98, uh, we're going to go through the entirety of it. It's just nine verses and it's kind of broken up into three three verses, if you will, um, not in the sense of scripture verses, but in the song verses, right? Three stanzas. Um, and we're going to take a look at how this sort of identifies the different um, ways in which we would know Christ. And I think this this ties very cleanly uh, with with Christmas, right? The, the wonderful message of Christmas, the coming of Messiah. And in fact, we'll come to find that this psalm has a special place in uh, in our history and, and how we sort of celebrate Christmas. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute. As always, though, let's pre- uh, begin with a word of prayer. Ask God to bless the, uh, the reading, the hearing, the teaching, and the application of his word. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we pray that you would just be with us here tonight. Uh, Lord, it's always that you would give us wisdom, that you would teach us something new uh, about you, help us to understand you, and help us to follow you uh, better in our lives. Lord, we pray that um, your spirit would just uh, give us new wisdom and insight. Lord, that you would leap from the page and uh, just be be made real all over again, uh, Lord, in our lives here at this time. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as I said, um, Psalm 98, let's read this together. I'm going to put it up on the screen for those who uh, don't have a Bible handy, and then I'll be reading from mine. Would you join me as we read Psalm 98? A sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and with the sound of melody. With trumpets and with the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. The world and those who dwell in it, let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. As I mentioned, um, you know, this psalm uh, has a special place in uh, sort of modern Christian history. Uh, many people don't realize this, but the, the popular Christmas song, Joy to the World, uh, was actually written based off of this. In fact, it wasn't even intended to be written as a song. Um, there was no music to it. This was originally a poem. Uh, that was written, um, and this was uh, by Isaac Watts, and he was going through a process of sort of writing poems based off of Psalms. And so this was sort of the second half of what he had written about Psalm 98, and these these words have come to be what we now know as the lyrics to uh, the popular song, Joy to the World. And so uh, as we kind of walk through this, you know, hopefully we can kind of see what he was gleaning from this and, and how it really has become uh, just this wonderful reminder of uh, the promised uh, Messiah that was to come. Uh, again, that wasn't the, the intention of uh, this this particular psalm here, um, but this is the, the message that he, he got from this. So let's just walk through this. As I mentioned before, uh, it sort of creates three uh, identities in which we would know the Messiah as, and I've sort of broken those down with a little bit of color highlighting here Um you know, first three verses are one of them, second three, third, um, you know, sat here. And uh, let's just kind of walk through and see what this looks like. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. First and foremost, we would know the Messiah as our Savior, right? This is the beauty and the wonderful promise of Christmas is that a Savior, right, was coming for us. A Savior um, would come to this world to redeem us. And of course, you know, at at the time of this writing, uh, the expectation was that the Messiah was going to come and and redeem his people from an earthly oppressor. But we know now uh, the Messiah came to uh, to free us from the greatest oppression of all, right? So sin. Um, so he has come to set us free from the bondage of sin. Uh, the the imperative here to sing to the Lord a new song. We've talked about this a few times because this exact expression is used uh, many, many times throughout the Psalms. Um, it's, I believe it's about six in total, uh, which doesn't sound like a high number, but but when you see it repeated that many times, you know, if you see something repeated in Scripture twice, it's significant. If you see it repeated six times, 
it really means something. Um, and the way we, we typically look at this is to understand that it's not saying that old songs are bad by any means. Uh, the way I've, I've always kind of referenced this is that, you know, as the psalmist would write these songs, you know, he's sort of trying to encapsulate in whatever form he can, right, to the best of his ability, the way he knows God. He's trying to describe God within the confines of a poem or a song. Again, many of these were originally written as poems. They weren't intended to be sung, uh, but they have become songs. Um, so he has tried to encapsulate the entirety of God into this, this work of art. Uh, but by the time it finishes, you know, God seems to become bigger. And we find this to be true in our own lives. You know, if you were to sit down and try to write down all the things that you know about God, um, in the process of doing that, you seem to learn more about him, right? In the process of writing down uh, all the examples that you have of God's goodness, all the blessings that you've received from him, uh, he seems to almost grow in, in that process. And so by the time you're done with whatever list or poem or song or whatever it is that you may be writing, it's no longer big enough to accurately describe the God that you now know. And this, this seems to be the, the trend that we find here with the psalmist. And he continues to encourage people to sing to him a new song. By the time that you finish that one, God will have continued blessing you. And, and there is new praise that he is due because he has done wonderful new things. Uh, so again, it's not saying that there's anything wrong with the old songs, uh, but it is just simply saying that we should continually be trying to find new ways to praise God because he is continually uh, finding new ways to bless us, new ways to love us, new ways to lead us, and he is worthy of that continual praise. I'm going to go ahead and put this back up here so we can look at it together. Uh, his right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him, right? It's important to note here that this teaches us something very important about salvation. Usually when you see reference to, you know, the right arm of God, um, we've, we've mentioned this before in sort of the imagery of this era, right? Typically the right arm was kind of the fighting arm. It was the, you know, the sword arm. The left arm was usually the one that, you know, had your shield. It was the, the arm of defense or protection. Um, so when there's this reference to the right hand um, and the holy arm in this case, you know, this is, this is the, the work of, of God and this is the strength of God at work. When we start talking about salvation, this requires the strength of God, the right arm of God, and reminds us that salvation is not something we could have accomplished. We simply don't possess that kind of strength. We're not strong enough. We don't have the right arm of God. We don't have the strength of God, uh, but it required the strength of God, that right hand, that holy arm, uh, to work salvation. Uh, so salvation is the Lord's. It belongs to the Lord. Uh, and to him, again, goes the glory, um, which kind of ties us back to the sing to him a new song, right? He continues uh, to bless us, continues to lead us. He continues uh, to save us. We know salvation is, is once and for all. It's not a, a continual process, but he continues to bring about salvation uh, in the lives of those in this world. And so we continue to praise him and sing to him a new song. Uh, all the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Uh, salvation has been made available to the ends of the earth. All have uh, have received this precious uh, gift has been made available to them. Doesn't matter, you know, where you are. Um, you know, God, of course, you know, He had His people um, here in the Old Testament, and that has expanded in the New Testament. We have been grafted on uh, to uh, to the nation of Israel, to His people, and and salvation has been made available to all. It doesn't matter where you're from. Doesn't matter who you are. Um, God has a love for you, and he, he desires for you to know that and to know his salvation. Uh, we move from verse 4 into verse 6. This is sort of our second stanza here. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the king the Lord. And that last line there uh, tells us exactly where this section is going, you know, how we are to know the Lord in this context, and that is as a king. This was the promise of Messiah that a king was coming to rule over us. Um, and again, rule over who? Well, if we go back to uh, verse 3, right, the, the ends of the earth, a king coming to rule over all, not just, uh, you know, the, the nation of Israel, not just God's people, but rule over all of us. Uh, 
and and you know a king is a wonderful wonderful thing when you have a benevolent king when you have uh, a righteous king which we'll we'll touch on that in just a minute the next section actually talks about that when you have uh, a king that is trustworthy when you have a king that truly does care for his people that is a wonderful wonderful thing there's a sense of protection that comes from that there's a sense, sense of calm in knowing that you are cared for in knowing that uh, you know you have a wise king that you can follow and so when we look at this we were reminded um, that we have been given someone the, the messiah would come and we can put our trust in him we can be led by him uh, again we see the the imperatives here to to praise him right make a joyful noise um, break forth into joyous song sing praises um, again it mentions you know these instruments here i've said before if you don't happen to play any instruments that's okay that's okay um, you can praise him with whatever it is that you have right whether it's you know singing or or you know the playing of instruments or you know the creation of art or whatever it is that you do right god has given you a gift he has given you a way in which that you can praise him uh, and so I want to encourage you, you know, whatever you have, whatever gift you've been given, uh, give it back to the Lord, right? He gave it to you for a purpose that you can take it and mold it into something that glorifies him. So I want to encourage you to do that um, again, whether it's singing or playing or, or whatever it is. Of course, this was uh, sort of, you know, David's uh, gift that he had. He was a musician, so he's using these terms. Uh, but the, overall, the imperative here is that we are praising the Lord for what he has done. He is this king that we can trust in. We have a righteous ruler. We have a wise king uh, that we can trust in who has come and who has brought us salvation. We know him first as savior. We know him then as king. Verse seven continues on, uh, let the sea roar and all that, fills, uh, all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. So this third section here reminds us that the Messiah would come as a judge. And I want to come back to that in just a second. As we look at this text here, I want to point out, though, um, you know, I mentioned in the very beginning that this was the inspiration for the lyrics that we now have uh, for the, the popular Christmas carol, uh, Joy to the World. right? And throughout the, the entirety of Joy to the World, there's this... Uh, sort of repeated um, uh, idea that the the world itself is sort of proclaiming his glory, right? That the world itself is crying out to him. And we see this here. Let the sea roar and all that fills in it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, right? There's that the earth itself is proclaiming his glory. So it's not just the people. There's an imperative for the people to praise God, uh, again, verses four through six. But beyond that, it's all of creation. It's not just, uh, you know, God's people that he has created, but it's in the entirety of the world. You know, the trees cry out to him. The rocks cry out to him. The rivers, as we see here, they clap their hands. Uh, the hills um, sing for, for joy. Um, so, so all of creation is coming together pro to proclaim God's glory because he is worth it, right? He has created all of these things. He, um, he rules over all of these things. You know, it's not just simply that he is a king over a people. He's a king over all creation. And he has come as a judge. And let me put this back up here so we can look at this together. We are told that he will come to judge the earth. That is also a source of comfort, right? When there is injustice in the world, a righteous judge is the one who comes along and sets things right. Um, and I, I want to emphasize righteous judge, right? There's when, when we, uh, not to say that, you know, the judges of this world aren't, aren't doing their best. We won't want to assume that that is always the case, but we are still people. We are still flawed at the end of the day. And we are going to have uh, mistakes made along the way. But we have a God, we have a king, we have a savior who is a righteous judge, uh, who judges perfectly, right? And so he, uh, he looks at this world, he looks at each and every one of us, and he judges with righteousness. And we see that uh, here at the tail end of verse 9, he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. We have a fair God. Now, in the context of the original writing, uh, this was a very important uh, thing to hear. You know, uh, the idea of injustice, the idea of, of inequality, um, 
differences in, in equity uh, is nothing new in, in human history, right? We've always had these kinds of things happening with uh, corruption within uh, you know, governmental systems and societies and things of that nature. That's always been the case because we're people, right? That's this is sort of what we do. We are flawed people. We have always been flawed people and we will always be flawed people. Um, and so try as we might, you know, it's not to say we shouldn't continue to try to make things better. We absolutely should. Um, but the reality is, you know, that's just kind of built into who we are as people. That's, that's the nature of sin in this world is that there's always going to be, uh, the, the, the inequalities, there's always going to be uh, unfairness at things, you know, there. so to have a judge who will judge us with righteousness is important. Again, it should be a source of comfort that God has come to make things right. He has come to uh, undo the wrongs that have been done in this world. When we look at this, um, you know, again, this, this psalm wasn't necessarily uh, intended to, to speak uh, about uh, Jesus, you know, of course, being born into this world. The, the song here, um, it was talking about what God was going to do um, for his people, right? Again, it was, it was, there was an expectation of a very different sort of Savior at that point in time. And we now, of course, know him to have been uh, something different. He has saved us from something much greater than any sort of worldly uh, oppressor. He has saved us from sin, which is an eternal oppressor, right? Something that separates us from God for eternity. Uh, he has come to save us from that. Uh, and he has done so with righteousness. He is righteous and is able to do these things because he is perfect. He has that strong arm, that holy arm. Uh, and he is right to govern over us because he is our holy king, our righteous king. Uh, as we step into you know, Christmas in just a few days here, uh, I pray that we would be mindful of that. You know, so many times we sort of get lost up in uh, what we have kind of allowed Christmas to become, uh, just the, you know, sort of the season of gift giving and, and all these things. And uh, it's not to say those are bad, you know, the, the giving of gifts and spending time with family. Those are wonderful things. But it's a time to remember the Savior that we've received. And not just the Savior, but the coming King, the coming righteous Judge, Messiah would come to be all of these things and still is all of these things. Um, and so it's important for us to remember exactly the gift that we were given uh, on that wonderful, wonderful night. Um, just truly who Messiah is. So I want to encourage you to think about that uh, as you celebrate together uh, in the coming days. Um, again, the birth of our Savior. It's an important, important thing. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you. Uh, first and foremost, for every blessing that we have received from you, uh, Lord, we ask that you would help us to sing to you a new song. You continue to bless us in new ways. You continue to love us in new ways and uh, display your power and might in new ways. And Lord, you are worthy of new praise. So I pray that you would put a new song of praise on our lips and give us the boldness to sing it. Uh, whatever gift it is that we have, uh, whether it be you know our voices or, or the playing of instruments or whatever it is, Lord, whatever you have given us, I pray that we would take it and turn it back uh, and to praise for you, uh, because you are worthy. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to follow you. Uh, you are king. Uh, Lord, we don't really understand what that means uh, these days. You know, we haven't we haven't had a king here, uh, you know, ever. And so we don't understand what it means uh, to truly submit sometimes. And uh, I think it's hard for us to imagine what a righteous king would be like. But Lord, we have that in you. And we can trust in you, we can trust in your leadership, we can trust in your governance and your sovereignty. And so we pray, uh, Lord, that you would help us to submit to you, to truly follow wherever you would have us to go, and to trust in you uh, with all of our hearts. And Lord, we thank you for being a righteous judge over us. Uh, again, uh, we don't always understand what it means to have righteous judges. But Lord, we know that you have come to judge. And we pray, uh, Lord, that we would be living lives uh, that, that, uh, that please you. And uh, Lord, that you would uh, that you would judge us as well, or that we would be found righteous before you, not because of uh, Lord what we've done, but because of what you've done. Lord, you have brought about salvation. You have redeemed us in every way. Lord, you have forgiven us of our sins, and you have given us mercy and grace. And Lord, we we don't ever want to forget that. So we pray that you would help us to always remember that, and to be uh, to be grateful and, and uh, Lord to praise you for what you continue to do. And we ask all of these things, praying in the way that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those that have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, as always, church family, thank you uh, for joining us tonight. It's been a uh, privilege to uh, open God's Word and share it with you. Um, Merry Christmas to all of you. May God bless you in the days to come and this wonderful reminder we have of the birth of our Savior. God bless.